This video is sponsored by Only Crits. I'm not really sure why, but for some reason, I've got dragons on the brain. And thankfully, I play a game called Dungeons & Dragons, so there must be a ton of great dragon content out there for me to use in my games, right? Well, yeah, in fact, there are two 5e-compatible dragon-focused books that have just come out in the last couple of years. The first is Fizzban's Treasury of Dragons, an official publication from Wizards of the Coast. And the second is The Game Master's Book of Legendary Dragons from Jetpack 7. Which one should you get for your game? Well, we're going to see what's in each book and help answer that question for you. So that way, if you want to run your own version of a Chroma Conclave style storyline where the heroes fight a bunch of dragons, you can have the tools to run a dragon themed campaign or just give you more interesting dragons to use in your adventures. Neither of these companies sponsored this video. I'm just taking a look at two books that I already owned and seeing what we can learn from them. A quick caveat. I'm not really a stats guy. I can't tell you if anything in either of these books is overpowered or underpowered for its CR. I can't tell you if this content is balanced because I haven't used these materials in my games yet. So I'm just going to talk about the things that I think are cool and the things that don't do much for me. Speaking of things that don't do much for me, let's start with some of the lore in the very beginning of Fizz Bands. This sounds harsh, but I'm going to say a lot of great things about this book. We're which not there yet. This book opens with a lot of focus on the lore of the first world, which establishes that dragons came from this first world that existed before all other D&D worlds. And apparently every D&D world, including your homebrew worlds, spun out of the first world and dragons are connected to all of them. There is even a lot of content in here about how dragons can sense their counterparts in other universes. Now, on the one hand, I don't want to harp on this for too long because this is only two pages of text, but on the other hand, this is a huge theme weaving through many sections of this book, so let's discuss it. Speaking completely personally, since I can only tackle this subject from my own perspective, I think it's super odd that dragons are now multiverse-spanning avatars of the material plane. On the one hand, I appreciate the plot hook it gives game masters to create dragons modeled after villains like Kang the Conqueror, or Jet Li in The One. The bad Jet Li, not the good Jet Li. There are two Jet Li's in The One. But honestly, the inclusion of this dragon lore kind of feels like a way to justify all their D&D stories existing in one multiverse, which is fine, but it just feels like overkill. That said, it's not the end of the world, and I guess it does open the door for GMs to take specific dragons, like a Shardalon or even Raishan, and put them in any campaign setting. And there's even a sidebar about how certain dungeons with connections to dragons can appear in any D&D world, which is why the Tomb of Horrors is in the Forgotten Realms when it started as part of Greyhawk, because... A Sarak killed a bunch of metallic dragons while working on it or something, which is kind of a stretch. Like, it's fine. It's just kind of a lot of extra steps when you could just say any dungeon or dragon could exist in any reality because you're the GM and you can just do that and that's fine. Linking it to dragons just seems odd to me. And this concept especially just doesn't seem like it reinforces the core fantasy of dragons. But, you know, it's Wizards of the Coast's IP. If they want to make it all one big multiverse, that's fine. Like I said, it just does not do much for me. Then we get some of the player options, and first of all, hey, <clears throat> Wizards of the Coast, referencing the idea that dragons could be a warlock patrons in your flavor text, but not actually giving us dragon-themed warlock subclass? Rude. But honestly, the stuff in this section seems cool. I like how there are new dragonborn subraces that are specifically different if your character is a chromatic, metallic, or gem dragonborn. At fifth level, chromatic dragonborn get a brief immunity to their corresponding element, which is pretty powerful, but... We've talked many times on this channel about 5e's power creep over the past nine years. All these new races are, are pretty powerful. But this ability is cool and thematically appropriate, so I dig it. Metallic Dragonborn get two types of breath weapons, which reflects the stat blocks of Metallic Dragons. That's a really cool change. And Gem Dragons are just doing their own thing. They're heavily psionic, and honestly, I just don't care about psionics. But if you like them, that's cool. They're in the book. The Monk subclass, the Way of the Ascendant Dragon, seems pretty cool. The Drake Warden Ranger is also fun. It lets you have a dragon companion that you can ride. It can't fly until a little bit higher level, which is a bummer, but I get it. It's good for game balance. And the feats in this book... Or whatever. Feats in 5e are completely broken, so who cares? The new spells are all pretty cool, but this book does two really smart things with them. First, most of these spells seem to be named after dragons. That's good. If you're making a book like this, you gotta use that IP. But second, the art shows dragons casting these spells, which is a really nice reminder of the philosophy that if a PC can use something cool in a new 5e product, then so can the enemies. And I really like the idea of a dragon casting spells the players haven't seen before, and then the players can go on to learn these spells themselves. I've always really liked that concept. 
Running through the new magic items, they're cool. I'm glad we get stats for the Dragon Lance here. I love that we get another magic bow. There are far too few of them in 5e. And the Flail of Tiamat is definitely something that's going into one of my games, especially if I ever run Tyranny of Dragons again. I could just imagine a henchman with this Flail who could be a really cool secondary antagonist for most of the campaign. I love the Gold Canary figurine of Wondrous Power as well. I also love how many of these magic items are made from dragon parts, which means, conceivably, the players could make a lot of these magic items themselves. However, I'm not wild about the Platinum Scarf. It's covered in Platinum Scales, and you pull a scale off and it does magic things, but you can only pull three scales every day for some reason, and then all the missing scales grow back, so why describe it as covered in scales if you can only pull off three and they regenerate anyway? Maybe it could have been something else that made more sense. Like, it could still be a Platinum Scarf if you wanted, but maybe it has three gems embedded in it or something? But as it stands, the magical limitations feel completely arbitrary, because... The narrative doesn't match the rules that are there to balance the game. Speaking of rules that don't match the narrative, let's talk about Horde magic items. Look, I know we all love the idea of magic items that level up with the party. I mean, maybe you don't, but a lot of us do because they make magic items feel more special, which helps prevent magic item churn. In our coverage of the Vox Machina campaign, Matt Mercer is about to introduce some magic items that level up over time, a bunch of which are in the Tal'Dori setting book. But his approach is just one method. There are a bunch of great sources and explanations out there for magic items that change and advance as the heroes level up. And in theory, tying a more powerful magic item to a dragon's horde is cool. But in order to level up these magic items, you basically have to place them into another dragon's horde and let them marinate in the horde's inherent magic for a day or two, and I, I just don't like this. I do think it's a good excuse to get heroes questing after more dragons of older ages and higher challenge ratings, but putting things back into hordes is completely contrary to the core fantasy of a dragon's horde, which is all about finding new cool stuff. Plus, I still don't love the idea that dragon hordes are made magical by dragons, because I like it more when dragons go out and find magic stuff rather than emanating their own magic. But in fairness, it is compatible with the idea that dragons' layers also affect the surrounding environment, and dragons affect their layers, so, I mean, it kind of works. And honestly, if we were talking about a giant or a hag and you were putting a magic item into their cauldron for eight hours, that I could get behind. But since we're talking about dragons, what if instead of putting the magic item into other dragons' hordes, instead you could take a magic item from a dragon horde and then it leveled up the more wealth you gained? The next time you encounter a horde and you take something from it, the items you've already got get stronger. Because these items haven't just inherited some of the dragon's magic, they've soaked up some of the dragon's greed. Then maybe it eventually levels back down if you give up the wealth or the items you got from the horde, at least without getting something of equal or greater material value. I mean, even if we just jump to page 67, there's a chart with examples of connected magic items like the Rod of Seven Parts that could be spread across multiple hordes. You could use discovery of specific items as the benchmark for leveling up magic items found in dragon hordes. I think that would work a lot better than the mechanics they provided. Okay, enough teasing. Let's get into the dragons themselves. Phrasing. A huge section of this book is just about role-playing ideas and plot hooks for dragons in your games, and this entire section is just rich with ideas. Even if I don't call out every section or spend as much time on this part of the book, there's a lot of stuff here. I'm really fond of the charts of names and physical appearances. They're the kind of thing we got for a bunch of different kinds of monsters back in Volo's Guide to Monsters. I'm not wild about the Cult of the Dragon entry that basically says, for an example of an evil plot by the Cult of the Dragon, go by Tyranny of Dragons. But on the other hand, the same chapter also has a single paragraph about the different ways that dragons might treat their followers, and there's a reference to the idea that some dragons treat their followers like their children, which gave me the idea for a dragon villain with some of the mannerisms of Thanos, and that's always cool. There's also a section that references the campaign-shaking events from the Dungeon Master's Guide, which is one of my favorite parts of that book, so I love that they go, hey, what might it look like if everything on that chart was dragon-themed? It's great. There's also a reference to the phenomenon where people are born near a dragon's lair, and they're born as half-dragons. Not because the dragon got freaky with anybody, just because of the inherent magic of the dragon being in the radius. Man, if only we got some special playable stats for that kind of character. Oh well, I probably won't come back to this idea later on. And there's also a super quick reference to cursed gold being found in a dragon's horde. And I don't know about you, but that got my mind spinning about how to tell Pirates of the Caribbean. But instead of an Aztec curse, it's a dragon curse. That could be cool as hell. Then we got a whole chapter of every kind of dragon, including not just chromatic, metallic, and gem dragons, but also deep dragons, dragon turtles, fairy dragons, all of it. And we don't get stats here. The stats come later. But we do get a bunch of customized charts 
for personality traits, ideals, spells they might know, plot hooks to create an adventure around them, creatures who might work with them or be rivals with them depending on the dragon's age, some examples of a famous member of that family of dragons from the D&D multiverse, a layer map, and some art objects you might find in the horde. I would definitely come back to these charts whenever I wanted to draft an adventure around a specific type of dragon. For example, we just saw an ancient green dragon in the most recent episode of Critical Role Demystified, so let's roll on these charts to see what we get for an ancient green dragon. Personality traits. I harbor no animosity toward anyone. Let me grow ancient with my forest and I'll leave you in peace. Ideal. Control. All lesser beings should bare their throats to their betters. Evil. It's somewhat contradictory, but then again, there are plenty of people who say they don't want to bother anybody, but actually spend a lot of their time hurting other people. And actually, you know, this green dragon says that they harbor no animosity towards anybody. They don't want to hurt anyone as long as everyone else who lives in the forest knows their place and doesn't need to be punished. But if this dragon feels that people aren't respecting it, it might take no pleasure in hurting others, but it'll still do it if it feels it has to. Okay, yeah, that works. If you want to give the dragon spells, then an ancient green dragon has a spell save of DC 19, and they can cast invisibility, mass suggestion, plant growth, and speak with animals. Here's the adventure hook. A green dragon is terrorizing a forest settlement, murdering and eating someone each night before depositing the grisly remains in the village square. So okay, we know this dragon claims they won't hurt anybody if they're not bothered, so maybe we'll discover that someone from the village crossed in the forest when they were not supposed to, or there are rumors of rebels in the village, or maybe just somebody offended the dragon in some way. Next, we roll for connected creatures. There are different charts depending on the age of the dragon, so for an ancient dragon, we get... An ancient green dragon returns to the same sylvan forest every year to feed upon a herd of unicorns. Okay, that's cool and horrible. We can do some interesting stuff with that, I'm sure. Maybe somebody hid the unicorns in town to spare them, and so the dragon is taking revenge and making an example of them. We get a map of a green dragon lair, we can just drop right into our game, and we can roll for an art object that we'll find in the dragon's hoard. The baby teeth of a humanoid preserved in amber furred with a golden fungus that smells like gingerbread? Wow, I mean, okay, people make a lot of jokes about how weird and bad modern art is, but seriously, what the hell? This actually kind of feels like it could be a hag thing. Maybe this is because I associate teeth and going after children with hags, and maybe just because I like hags. And you know what, just for fun, let's jump back a couple chapters and get some other details from some of the previous charts. For the dragon's appearance, we rolled that the dragon has sharpened or serrated scales. That's awesome. They're kind of like shark skin, but still scaly. That's cool. Mannerisms. The dragon sharpens its claws or horns on nearby stone surfaces. That works perfectly. We can actually show the dragon sharpening their scales. Plus, maybe they sharpen their claws, and you can just describe that nails on a chalkboard sound. That will definitely get a reaction out of your players. How about a bond for the dragon? I treasure one particular item in my hoard, a gift from a person I loved who is long since dead. So is that the teeth thing? That's cool and also still very gross. Did this dragon love a hag? That could be cool. Okay, and the dragon has a flaw. I find adventurers fearsome, and I'm convinced that I'll meet my doom at their hands one day. That's cool, it's a paranoid dragon, or maybe just a fatalistic dragon. Maybe because adventurers killed their hag lover, and they assume it's only a matter of time until they go as well. Okay, and now let's roll randomly for the name. There are four charts, so we'll just roll four times and build a name from that. Othim, Andusk, Akan, Karen. Okay, that's overkill, but we can work with that, move some things around, drop some of the words, combine others, and I land on Othkanadusk. I dig it. That works. Oh, and there's a chart to determine the dragon's goal. Destroy one or more gods as an act of vengeance or to ascend to godhood. Okay, so maybe that's why they're eating unicorns, since unicorns are celestials. Maybe they heard that there's a god who became a unicorn, so they're hunting that unicorn? There's some potential there for sure. Oh, and there's a chart for what happens when the dragon dies, so we roll and we get... The dragon's body transforms into stone, metal, lava, ice, or mist. Or the body dissipates, leaving behind only a transformed heart or some other organ. Okay, so with just a few rolls, we've got a pretty cool dragon and a plot so our heroes can get involved. Finally, Fizzbands gives us a bestiary, and again, I'm not evaluating the mechanics today, but here are just my reactions to what's in the book. First, there are no stats for ordinary chromatic or metallic dragons, which means this is meant to sit alongside the monster manual. It doesn't replace the dragons in that book. Also, here are the creatures in the bestiary that I just think are pretty cool. The animated breath, which is like an elemental that emerges from a dragon's breath. We get aspects of Bahamut and Tiamat, and great worms, which are like older than ancient dragons. We get great worms for all the chromatic, metallic, and gem dragons. The aspects and the great worms all share a cool trait. 
When they drop to zero hit points, they unlock a second phase, like a video game boss battle. We also get the Draco Hydra, which unfortunately still does not solve the Hydra problem for combining the lore of a Hydra losing and gaining heads with the mechanics of hit points. They have not figured that out yet. We get Draconians, which are monsters from the Dragonlance setting that are kind of like Dragonborn, but when they die, they each have a unique effect. It's very cool. We get the Elder Brain Dragon. This is the monster I saw go viral when this book came out. Just a fantastic bit of nightmare fuel. We get the Horde Scarab, which I love. Anything that helps me play out the plot of the mummy at my table automatically gets a gold star. There's the Hollow Dragon, which is like an undead metallic dragon that looks kind of like an Azir or, or like Ghost Rider. I also like the Lion Dragon and the Sea Serpent. Oh, and also we get Gem Dragons at every age, but again, I just don't care about Psionics, so those just don't do much for me. I know some people love Gem Dragons because they have Psionic powers, at least I assume that must be true for somebody. But honestly, I think Gem Dragons are cool just because cool looking gems are cool. But you know what, if I want to scratch that itch and get some cool looking precious stones, I don't actually need the gem dragons to do that. Because I can get beautiful dice from only crits. Because yes, they actually do have stone dice. Dice that look like cracked marble or amethyst or labradorite. I also like the blood hex stone dice and the seaweed tangle stone dice. You can also get a mystery package of gemstone slash glass dice or a huge gemstone dice bundle. And if you visit onlycrits.com slash supergeekmike and use the promo code supergeek at checkout, you can save 12% off your order, and a portion of your payment goes to me instead of onlycrits, which helps my channel out a lot. Once again, that's onlycrits.com slash supergeekmike and use the promo code supergeek. Thank you so much to onlycrits for sponsoring this video. Next, let's move on to the book, The Game Master's Book of Legendary Dragons, which just for the purpose of this video, I'll sometimes just call it Legendary or Legendary Dragons. And we can see a difference almost immediately. Because this is not a broad guide like Fizzbands, which wants to give you a whole bunch of robust tools, and by that I mostly mean random charts, to create any dragon adventure that you want. Instead, this book comes with a directory of 26 powerful legendary dragons. That's the opening of this book. Each one has at least a page of cool lore and backstory, plus a plot hook, encounter advice and tactics, what kind of treasure they might have if they have a horde, layer actions, and the dragon stats. Now again, I'm not rating these based on their stats today, but just so you know the scale, no pun intended, of what we're talking about today, one of these dragons is challenge rating 17. All the others are somewhere between challenge rating 21 and 30. A bunch of these dragons are also pretty powerful spellcasters. So in short, these are creatures you can't fight until you are extremely high level. But some of them can be the final boss of a campaign, or others can maybe be the focus of an entire arc, or maybe even the focus of an entire 20 level campaign. And some others could actually be allies to the heroes. Now, in general, there's not as much focus here on the rigidity behind chromatic dragons. We get some reference to metallic dragons. A few of these dragons used to be metallic of a certain color or share most of the traits of a metallic dragon. But the others are not just a great big red dragon or a green dragon, but with one thing changed. The scale color of the evil dragons does not have as much bearing on their personality and doesn't always match their breath. The emphasis is instead on turning these into awesome folkloric figures, not categorized and classified types of creatures based on their scale colors. These are not just intended to be a big deal when you fight them. They're major forces in the world and are not to be taken lightly. If you run these in your games, you may want to prepare your players and tell them not to expect the typical chromatic powers and personalities. Some of the dragons even have multiple types of dragon breath, like Kundul, the rainbow dragon. Well, okay, sure, that one just makes sense. But also Pelix, the stalker who mostly looks like a white dragon, but is not just an ice dragon. Even Tyrnan, the two-headed dragon, doesn't just have the breaths of a black and silver dragon. It has six different types of dragon breath. But I also want to highlight some of my favorite dragons from this book. I love Anoth Zul, the mummified dragon queen. She's a tool of a cult who is manipulating her, so you can deal with the cult for several levels before you even encounter the dragon. And there's a decent chance you could even get that dragon on your side. I like the way Off Gebin, the Dark Cloud, feels more like an omen or a rumor, like the Wild Hunt. Fury, the Dragon Queen of Hell, is the spiteful ex-wife of the devil. She's just got huge boss-ass bitch energy. We get an entry for Jormungand, the World Serpent, who is really given the gravity he deserves, and also spends a lot more time as a black cat than you might expect. Carnagon, the Morning Star, is a psychopomp, a guide for the souls of the dead. Kundul, the rainbow dragon, is the perfect mentor for a monk, like maybe the dragon monk from Fizzbands, maybe, kinda. Naki, the stone dragon, literally astrally projects himself everywhere, which makes him perfect for a long-running campaign, because your heroes could interact with him a bunch of times before they ever actually fight him. Vanadon Necroth, the scaled Book of the Dead, is such a fantastic character to go and seek an audience with, or try to steal from. I, I, I love him. And I already mentioned Tiernan, the two-headed dragon, but, you know... 
You can basically take any Two-Face plot from any Batman comic or TV show and replace Two-Face with this dragon and it would work perfectly. So that's automatically a fantastic character. Now, after we get this awesome compendium of dragons, we also get some other cool stuff. They've got a Dragon Rider class. It has some superficial similarities with the Drake Warden Ranger, including the gradual leveling up of the dragon itself. But the Dragon Rider is a completely martial character. Again, I can't compare these without having played them or having had someone in my games play these characters, but I think there's a very clear reason why these publishers both provided a dragon riding option for players. I think people might want to ride dragons, and these both seem like a cool way to make that dream a reality. We also get a new playable race, the Draken. And again, this is someone who was just born near a dragon's lair and inherited some qualities. But why not make them a dragonborn? Well, because the appeal of the Draken is not the mechanics. It's the vibe of someone who is at the whims of fate and has no control over the circumstances of their birth. Because when you make your character a Draken character, you literally roll for a bunch of mutations. Some of them are purely cosmetic, and others are boons or banes that give you mechanical benefits or disadvantages. We also get a list of monsters that are slightly less formidable than the Rolodex of Legendary Dragons we got earlier. This section includes a War Drake, a Drake of Displacement, which is very funny to me, some Dog Dragons known as Pudgeons, and a few others. We also get some variant kobolds who are members of the Hand of the Dragon, which are basically elite squads of kobolds born and bred for specific tasks. Then we get two cults that were referenced in some of the earlier dragon lore entries, and I really appreciate that both of these cult entries include references to the current leaders of these cults, and the recent political upheavals in the hierarchy of these cults, which happen to specifically be events that will drive these cults to be more active and make them more likely to wind up in the path of the players. It's a really nice touch. And then we get some of my favorite stuff in the back half of the book. Dragon hunting. Why do I love this so much? Well, because they basically lay out the idea that dragon hunting is illegal. Wait, why would it be illegal? Because dragons bring down their wrath on any town that might even be thinking of harboring dragon hunters, so the entire practice has been outlawed. But we also get a few factions from the old dragon hunting days, which are in various levels of still being active. Either they're existing only in rumor, or they're still limping along, or, in one brilliant stroke, one faction actually spun out of another. I feel like we hardly ever see that in D&D, but it happens all the time in the real world. And then we get rules for harvesting dragon parts, which again, is illegal, but people still do it. And then we get a list of spells that can be enhanced by using dragon parts. And again, this book does something really cool. It gives this material an inciting incident. These instructions on how to use dragon parts to enhance spells, they've only recently been rediscovered, which means an entire world with barely any dragon hunters is now starting to get really interesting in hunting dragons again, but they have to be smart about it, which makes this a fantastic way for your heroes to get in on the ground floor of an underground yet thriving new business venture. One that also puts them into direct conflict with a series of dragons. This idea of an underground dragon hunting society, the fact that people don't want them hunting dragons because it risks the wrath of the dragons, the mechanical benefits for using dragon pieces to enhance spells, this is all stuff you could drop directly into any campaign to great effect. But it especially works well for a monster hunting, dragon hunting game. Like, this would make a kick-ass detail to add to a West Marches game. I'm just saying. And then the book gives us stats for airships and rules for airship combat. Why is that? Are they telling us that we should be running a high magic game where skyships are a thing, like Tal'Dorei or Ravnica? No. Actually, they tell us that airships are extremely rare, but they used to be a lot more common. Back in the days of dragon hunting. And now that your heroes might be trying to hunt dragons, they could get paired up with a dragon hunter who is also the captain of an airship. And like, what a fantastic way to tie the airship directly into the dragon hunting. I also love how this world building is basically reinforcing a points of light style approach to your setting. Airships are rare, so there aren't a bunch of airships flying from city to city. Dragon hunting is outlawed, so there aren't a whole bunch of dragon hunting knights that you can recruit to help take you into battle with you. The dragon harvesting trade is in a state of flux, so don't expect to buy these kinds of components in any town square or magic shop. If you want them, you gotta go get your hands dirty and be an adventurer. You have to go kill a dragon. And then the book ends with some one-shots, which do a nice job of showing how these legendary dragons could play a role at many different levels. Now, I'm not gonna do full reviews of these. It's, it's really hard to review an adventure that I haven't run. That being said, I like what I'm seeing so far, and I especially like the messages these one-shots send to the Game Master. The first one-shot is for between levels 3 to 6, and it takes one of the dragons, makes them a potential ally of the heroes, and puts them into conflict with a lich. Obviously, at low levels, you are not meant to fight either the legendary dragon or the lich, but that's the point. This adventure shows how you can take one of these CR-20-whatever dragons, or even another formidable foe, like a lich, and weave them into the campaign without making them the boss monster the players have to try to kill at low levels. The second one-shot is for between levels 8 to 12 and focuses on the dragon hunting factions, and pits you against a powerful red dragon, but not one of the saucy beasts from the first chapter. 
because the goal of this adventure is to show the role these factions can play in your game. And the third one-shot is for between levels 17 to 20. This one does involve one of the legendary dragons, specifically Fury, the ex-wife of the devil. But even this adventure basically says, hey, yeah, you don't need to kill this dragon, and you, you, you probably shouldn't try. Again, what a cool way to remind the game masters reading this that, yeah, there's more than one way to end an adventure. These games do not all have to end with a knockdown, drag-out slugfest to kill one of these legendary dragons. You can set other objectives and get more diverse adventures and encounters. Again, I don't know how these one-shots actually run, but I do like what I'm seeing. So we've reviewed Fizban's Treasury of Dragons, and we've reviewed the Game Master's Book of Legendary Dragons. So which one should you buy? Well, honestly, these books are doing very different things. Fizban's is more general. It's basically guaranteed to have something for everyone. And part of that means that it can't go into a ton of detail, and that's okay. It gives us a ton of charts and options for randomizing your dragons, and a bit of lore to link them into existing settings, but it's much more concerned with you creating a bunch of dragon-themed adventures of various different levels, and creating a whole host of dragons to go with them. This is the book if you know you need to make a lot of dragons, and you just don't want to just make them all exactly like what you might find in the Monster Manual. These help you go deeper by giving you a lot of advice on a lot of different dragon-related subjects, all spread out, if that makes sense. Meanwhile, Legendary Dragons is specific. It has everything for some people. If you're not running high-level games and you don't have any plans to, then, like, half this book just is not for you. But if you do just want a bunch of awesome high-level dragons you can drop directly into your game, and that you can construct adventures around, but you don't have to do the hard work of actually creating the nuanced villains or detail of allies, then these are the dragons you're looking for. They have just enough detail to get your mind firing and get you thinking about a bunch of different plot lines and maybe even full campaigns that could be structured around these dragons as they weave in and out of the adventures. Also, not for nothing, but these powerful dragons could easily be converted into a game like Shadow Dark, where more of the monsters are unique creatures rather than just members of monstrous races. Because this book really does make each dragon feel special, feel like THE dragon your heroes will remember dealing with once, once the dust of the campaign settles. And that makes this an extremely valuable product. So if one of these sounds more compelling to you than the other, just go get that book. If both of these sound cool, get them both. I certainly don't regret getting both. I have a feeling I'm going to get a lot of use out of both of these. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and ring the bell. I make great videos every Monday and Thursday. Support me on Patreon to help this channel flourish and grow. Join my Discord server to hang out with other awesome community members. And follow me on Twitch to catch my live streams. I should finally be back doing that again now that I am mostly recovered from being sick. Also, I lied at the beginning of this video. I do know why I've been thinking about dragons. It's because of the most recent episode of Critical Role Demystified. Even if you do not care about Critical Role, uh, go check that video out. I'm really proud of it, and I think it's got a lot of really awesome lessons for GMs and players. Until next time, play fair, and have fun.